Welcome back to Clydesdale Media, where we bring you the best from the world of CrossFit. Podcasts, news, special interest, health, fitness. If you like what you hear, hit that subscribe button. Hit the notifier so you're the first to know when we have new episodes. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Good afternoon, everyone. This is the Clydesdale Media Podcast. I am Scott Switzer. I'm the Clydesdale. She is Kat Shear, and we are so privileged to have with us Dave Durante today, uh, owner, co-owner of Power Monkey Fitness. Uh, and we're going to get to him in a second, but before we do that, we need to thank our sponsor, um, C4 Energy. This weekend, they are having a Black Friday and a Cyber Monday Monday deal on all Extend and Sell You. Lore, sell you core products. Um, just go to sell you core.com or official extend.com and you can get any product buy one, get one half off. And I think you can mix and match those deals. So buy one product, get another product half off. Make sure you do that this weekend. A uh, good deal from C4 Energy. Thank you so much to them for being our sponsor. And now on to the show with Dave Durante. Dave, how you doing? Good. Thanks for having me on, guys. Yeah, so I'm excited to talk to you. Uh, you were a an alternate on the 2008 U.S. Olympic team in gymnastics. Uh, that's pretty cool. What um, what got you into gymnastics when you first started? Uh, jumping around furniture in my house. Uh, I grew up in New Jersey and uh, was just fortunate enough that there was a really nice gymnastics gym for boys, which is kind of rare. Even back then, it was rare. And uh, my mom didn't want me breaking her furniture. So she said, let me go th put you into a gym. And it was really within walking distance. And uh, I fell in love from the first time I walked in. I still remember first day was October 12th, 1986. First day I walked into gymnastics gym and never looked back. Awesome. So what is what was the incremental progress to get you from walking into a gymnastics gym to competing for a spot on the Olympic team? Uh, incremental is exactly the correct word. Uh, I was not a very talented gymnast. I was the kind of person that just chipped away at uh, all of the guys that were better than me physically and more talented. Uh, but I always really wanted it. I always was willing, able to put in um, the extra work and make the sacrifices that um, I thought would benefit me. And when you get a little taste of um, something happening that you didn't expect because you put some additional time and effort in, it's kind of contagious. It's something that you want more of. And so even from a young age, I played a ton of sports. Gymnastics was just one of them. And I just really loved the challenge that came along with gymnastics. And it ended up being the one that stuck. My body type is right for gymnastics. I, I kind of excelled in the sense that uh, I was able to um, put in that extra time, make those sacrifices, and actually start to catch up to those more talented guys. But to get to the point of being in the gym that first day and just being in awe of everything going on, to going to the point of actually heading to Beijing for the Olympic Games in 08. Um, that, that's more than just a single podcast. Uh, that, that, that's a 30-year that's a, that's a journey. But um, most, what I would say mostly is that you're exactly right. That's incremental gains. And what people need to, to do is take pride in the process and not focus so much about what the end goal is. The process is really what matters. And whether or not that end goal actually happens is kind of irrelevant. If it does, that's fantastic. But what I learned, people I've met, the places I went along the way are really the things that stand out in terms of my memory. So what all, so it's really easy. Like when I was, a, when I was a kid, my mom put me in tumbling and, and the gymnastics thing. Um, but at some point, like men gymnasts become jacked right? It's more than just tumbling and flexibility and mobility. There's a lot of aspects that we probably have no clue that go on behind the scenes. What does a typical training day look like for a gymnast? Yeah, it's, it's actually interesting. I think a lot of people see uh, gymnast body types. One, uh, you're talking about above the waist body type, because I don't think anyone's trying to get Correct. gymnast legs for the most part. But when we talk about <laughs> gymnast body type, uh, one, I have I think people probably know this and this is changing now when, when CrossFit has become a little bit more influential in terms of strength conditioning world, we're starting to see more lifting of weights and barbells and things like that. But when I was training, it was never a component of our, our training at all. 
Um, dumbbells were a part of our training, but most of it was body weight as it pertained to the movements that we were doing in our routines. What I would say, if someone wants to train like a gymnast, one of the biggest things that um, people are missing from their training in terms of building a gymnast type body is a lot more straight arm work, a lot more straight arm uh, type of strength training. Uh, we have a lot of movements on rings and parallel bars and those types of things that require not only the connective tissue around the elbow to be to be strong enough to be able to withstand that uh, those types of challenging lever positions, but it also builds uh, the the muscle to be uh, kind of structured in a particular way. And so, I think that's what most people, even if they do a lot of push and pull work, which is a big part of our training, the straight arm work is what I think most people are missing out in terms of building a gymnastics type body. Yeah, I experienced that firsthand when I was a kid. I I thought I could do anything. I was a swimmer. I was super fit. Um, we would do gymnastics in in the school gym, and then we had rings, and we would do some of the different kind of moves on that. And you know, you watch the the Olympics, and you see someone do an iron cross. And you're like, well, that'd be really cool to do. Oh yeah. And I got up there, and I tried that. I got about there, yeah. and then it just <laughs> fell apart. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I think most people don't even recognize. That's why I love CrossFit so much is that it's been able to do something that the gymnastics world has never been able to do. And that's give a form of comparison to the everyday athlete. It's the person watching on TV. Normally you're watching Olympic Games and there's this huge disconnect between the difficulty level of what a Simone Biles or whoever else is competing is doing versus what you can do as an athlete. Everything is just too challenging. So a backflip, a double backflip, and a triple backflip are all equally difficult. There's no form of comparison in terms of how real difficult that high level skill is. And so when you're doing an iron cross, you have no real form of comparison how long it takes to be able to actually do that movement, right? So CrossFit has now given a lot of athletes the ability to get up on rings and try a support position and be like, it's difficult for me to be able to support myself correctly, right? Let alone, you know, just resting your forearms up into the straps and internally rotating and, you know, using some additional assistance, but to do it correctly, that's really hard. Now to move it out an inch incrementally at a time to the point where we're actually holding horizontal. Now there's actually a form of comparison. So I think it's a huge step in us being able to help grow the sport. Cause if you take a football, you can throw a football, you can compare yourself to a Tom Brady, a Peyton Manning, Mahomes, whoever it might be. I know what I'm doing in comparison to what I see in TV. Now we're starting to have that a little bit in gymnastics. And I think that was always the missing link for a lot of years. Yeah. I'm always amazed though, that like, you know, the bar muscle up is, you know, one of those things that everyone kind of strives to in CrossFit. And yet it's like the lowest barrier to entry of like an uneven bar routine, right? Like, yeah. duh, you have to be able to do a muscle up before you can even start that whole process. So to me, that's, crazy to think. Yeah. About, you know, well, let, let me give you a little bit of comparison. Let me give you a little comparison here for your, for your listeners, for you guys. So first, uh, uh, I, I normally talk about this in my seminars and it's uh, I make a distinction just to make sure people understand that this is more for perspective than to demoralize you. Okay. So just understand <laughs> what we're saying here. Fair enough. A strict muscle up, strict muscle, up, very challenging movement uh, for an average crossfitter to do has no value in our code of points and our code of points is rated on a letter scale from A all the way up to J level skills. And a strike muscle up has no value. It's not even an A, not even A level movement. A kipping muscle up is an A level movement, but you have to do it with straight arms. You have to finish in support with straight arms. So if you finish 90 degree or lower, no value. But coming back to Scott, your movement, iron cross. What do you guys think from A all the way up to J level skill? Iron cross is a very difficult movement. What do you think that's worth? I would assume probably Jay, but you're B. probably going to tell us it's like a B or a C. It's a yeah. B. It's a B Holy level shit. movement. So an iron cross is a B level movement on rings. Think about that. From A to J, we have all of these skills, the development of the, these skills. It took me 12 years to learn an iron cross, which is a B level skill. So I'm saying that more just to help understand timelines. When we're talking about the development of these skills, they're normally not in, talked about in days or an open workout where someone's screaming at you that you're going to figure something out. <laughs> it's about weeks and months and years and even sometimes decades. So it's a chipping away process. It comes back to what you're talking about, Scott, this idea of small incremental gains over time. But they work and it's worth it. And the process and the methods are worth it in terms of long-term growth and long-term benefits. 
I'm going to come back to some other things, but while we're on rings and the muscle up, I do have a question for you because I was watching the Zalos games and one of the workouts had max ring muscle ups as part of each interval. Yep. And some of the athletes were coming almost up to support from, from the movement up, right? Almost full support. Others came in lower with the press out. The announcers were saying that those that came to full support were going to pay for that later in a workout. And I couldn't understand the logic behind that. Can you explain that to me? Sure. So I remember the workout. We actually just had uh, James Sprague on the other day and we were going through this workout because he won the workout. He ended up having 30 mi- 39 muscle ups over the course of those three rounds, which is incredibly impressive. Awesome. Um, so one thing about the fatigue that happened first on the, uh, the, uh, the bike and then the, the step overs prior to getting into the muscle ups in that workout. But with regards to that comment, it is a curious comment in the sense that what you have to understand is that there's there's a strength biased muscle up and then there's a swing biased muscle up. So the more swing that you generate, the more potential you have to finish higher. The, the pull will change if you're doing more of an extremity pull, will end up finishing kind of a lower dip. Or if you do a lat activated, kind of a, a, a straight arm pull down, which will happen, which will re- allow you to finish much higher in the support position. If you're doing a more swing based muscle up, you're taking some of the strength out of the equation, finishing higher into that catch position. I would prefer athletes doing it if it's allowable from a standard perspective, because sometimes competitions have required some form of dip push out rather than finishing a full lockout. If that's not a standard and you can actually finish as high as possible, that's what I would recommend most, most athletes doing. Mm. The comment that was made there is surprising to me in the sense that it really would depend on what the next workout is. And the reason why I bring that up is because if the person is finishing high, you're saving your push strength. You're saving your ability to do a dip rep on every single repetition. So if the next workout was a heavy tricep workout, that person is going to be in a much more beneficial position. The only place where I would see this potentially being detrimental, if there's a heavy lat activated Uh, movement pattern in the next workout because those straight arm pulls would require a little bit more lat activation or if it's a heavy grip workout. The reason why is because a heavy swing muscle up becomes more of a grip workout than a small swing workout, uh, a small, a smaller string strength bias muscle up. Does that make sense? So when you don't have as much swing, you don't need as much grip. So those are the two factors. If the, if the, the commentators knew that the next workout was either heavy lat activation or heavy grip workout, that's where I can see that being a disadvantage for someone catching high. But other than that, it seemed like a curious comment. Hmm. Does the, does so, core engagement have anything to do with either of those? Um, it shouldn't options? change. Shouldn't it change. Shouldn't change. Okay. Shouldn't change. The, the, the movement pattern is the same, whether the swing is big or small. Uh, it's just whether or not your body's rising higher. Um, your center of mass ends up coming higher as the swing increases which allows you to finish into a higher position, but the core positioning and the engagement through the entire midline doesn't really change. Okay. I, I live in Columbus, Ohio, and my daughter, when she was younger, her volleyball center was attached to Blaine Wilson's gymnastics yeah, center. Integrity gymnastics. Absolutely. Yeah. So I would have to walk through Blaine's place to get to her volleyball center. What those six, seven-year-old kids are doing on rings and bars blew me away. Oh, yeah. So how important is it to get kids in young, in gymnastics, to get that body awareness quickly? Well, I mean, if you're going on to be a gymnast, uh, and that's kind of your career path, it's very important. Uh, Obviously, the earlier, the more you can build the patterns. I wouldn't say it's 100% a necessity. Uh, but you don't see too many high level gymnasts that start when they're 10, 12, 15, 15 years old. It just doesn't really happen. Um, but my bigger recommendation would be to consider gymnastics to be irrelevant in terms of whether or not you want to go to the Olympics or get a collegiate scholarship, what gymnastics can do from fundament from a fundamental standpoint for any athletic endeavor is pretty substantial. So the earlier, earlier you can start. The, the coordination, the mobility, the, um, the, the awareness that you have translates 
to any other sport. I think martial arts has the same approach. You know, you start young, it gives your body that coordination that you need to be able to apply it to other things. But gymnastics is a really fundamental starting point for any athletic endeavor. And so I would highly recommend parents putting their kids in gymnastics early and young and not considering team or whether or not they're going to go on to high level gymnastics, but just give them the ability to play and use it more as a play time rather than um, thinking that this is going to develop into something long term. Uh, I have my daughters both in gymnastics now. You know, we have a gym in our house. We've been doing handstand since before they could walk. <laughs> and I'm not so con um, you know, concerned whether or not they're going to become a collegiate or Olympic gymnast. Um, I just want them to have the foundation that I think is important for any other physical movement. So speaking of college, you went to Stanford yep. um, and you competed in gymnastics there. You were an All-American. What was your favorite discipline coming up to the ranks? Yeah, I always tell people that I hated everything on a bad day and I loved everything on a good day. It depended on how the body felt. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was more of an upper body guy. Uh, but that was because I had very weak knees. My first day at Stanford, I got off the plane. I came from New Jersey. Very excited to go compete for the Cardinal. Go into the gym and I, I fell on my first turn and I blew out my knee. ACL, MCL, meniscus on my first day and my first turn. No. So, yeah, it was a brutal <laughs> way to start my college career. But I was a relatively weak gymnast when I started out uh, college. Still was growing. I, I was 4'11 and under 100 pounds when I got to college. And I went through, I mean, growth spurt is, uh, I mean, being very generous, but um, still, I'm 5'5 five five now. And uh, I ended up putting on, you know, six inches and, and about 40 pounds of weight over the course of my college career. And it allowed me to become strong. My coach told me, okay, you blew out your knee, but we're going to get your handstand better and we're going to get you strong. So my upper body events became uh, much more of a critical component of my gymnastics. Uh, rings was strong for me. Pommel horse, parallel bars, high bar was good on those events. Floor and vault, I was just getting through. But I was a pretty good all-arounder. I um, was pretty good across the board in terms of being able to uh, put up a score that um, was at least competitive. Um, I ended up being a pretty good all-arounder for Team USA for a number of years. So this is going to be an odd question. Hopefully you know the answer. Why a tree? Yeah. I, I don't understand the tree mascot for the Cardinal. Yeah, it's, <laughs> uh, it is interesting. So the St Stanford used to be the Stanford Indians. That was mm -hmm. our mascot for a very long time. Then the 50s, they decided that that, was, that needed to be changed. And I think it was the 50s. And they gave the student body the, um, the, the vote to make the change. And the students selected the Stanford Robber Barons as the name. Um, one, because I think Leland Stanford, the founder of the university, him and his wife, he was a uh, very wealthy railroad magnet. And I think they thought that that was funny. And the university was like, absolutely not. We're not letting the students choose anything ever again. So it will not be the robber barons. And they chose Cardinal as their backup. And so Cardinal is not the bird. It's the color, this deep red. And the tree was the designation as kind of the physical representation of it. So it's not so much a tree. Cardinal is the color. But we're very much that tree uh, there, there's a lot of redwoods and that kind of stuff in the Palo Alto and North, uh, Pacific, uh, Northern California. So that's just a representation of some of the stuff in the area, being that there's redwoods nearby. That's it. That was a very that good just answer. Proves, <laughs> that just proves that I am not smart enough to go to Stanford because you guys are way too deep of thinkers for me. Yeah, I, I don't know how I got into Stanford too, by the way. I, like, I think they <laughs> threw my application out the window and like a gust of wind just blew it onto the accepted pile. I still have no idea how I got in, to be honest with you. But I'll take it. I'm a proud alum. I love the school. And uh, yeah, but I'm not quite as smart as the rest of those people. So with the Olympics in 2008, as an alternate, do you get to travel to Beijing? Or did you just have to sit and wait and hope, not hope someone got hurt, but? Yeah, I understand. Um, my, my particular Olympic journey was a very unique one. And uh, I hope... Uh, if you're interested in hearing some about it, I'll tell you. It's just a little longer than maybe just a simple 
answer to that question. Okay. Would you like Let's to hear it? it? All yes. right. We'd well, love, we'd love to hear it. I, I won't go we too deep still. into it, but um, so the, the Olympic process is a few different steps in terms of how they do the selection. So we have a few competitions that um, aggregate the scores. And then um, you have the potential to have one or two of the spots guaranteed if you fin- if you win and then you have to win a couple events. It's more complicated than it needs to be. But there's a selection committee. And that selection committee picks the guys that go and compete on the Olympic team. So you perform, you compete in two com- competitions, four total. So two on one uh, competition and two on the other. And then the selection committee picks who's going. So in Beijing, we had um, our selection. I was selected as one of the alternates along with two other guys. So our top guy, Paul Hom at the time, had broken his hand at uh, our national championships. But he was so good that they wanted to put him on the, the team and hopefully have him heal up before we competed. They didn't think it was likely, but they brought three alternates onto the team. So there were nine of us total. And so we went to Colorado Springs. We had our Olympic uh, training camp. We had another full competition. And during that competition, they decided that Paul wasn't going to be able to compete. So me and the other two alternates, uh, Sasha Artemev and Raj Raj Bavzar, um, we had another selection at that camp after we competed. And Raj was selected to go in for Paul. So then there were eight of us. And... Then we went to Beijing. Yes. To answer your first question, do I get to travel? Yeah. So I was part of the entire experience. So we go to Beijing about two, two weeks early, you know, we're acclimating to the time training in the Beijing training facility uh, with the Chinese team. And that's a whole nother cool story in and of itself. And Paul's brother, Morgan, who was on the Olympic team as well. Both of them have made it to three Olympic games, 2000, 2004, and 2008. He, he got hurt as well. And we were curious as to whether or not he was going to be able to compete. And then the day before opening ceremony, we found out that Morgan was not going to be able to compete. And so me and Sasha had to show readiness. And one, we had to do a full competition before a couple of days before in the Beijing training center with uniforms, with judges to show readiness. We showed readiness and I hit all my routines. I felt like I was ready to go. I'm not going to go into like, the p- politics of this, because there are some, uh, but just the, the process more. We did a full competition, just me and the other alternate. And then the day before opening ceremony, Morgan pulled out. So now it was between me and Sasha to go in for the next day. They brought us back into the training center one more time, and we had to do two events, one floor routine, one palm horse routine. Those are the two events where Morgan was going to contribute the most to that team. And they needed to see who was going to contribute the most. Um, both Sasha and I were okay on floor. I hit my floor routine. Um, and both of us were pretty good on pommel horse. I was pretty good. Sasha was amazing on pommel horse. Amazing. Like he was already a world medalist, incredible on pommel horse. But there was always an issue between both of us, both of us about consistency. So we had to show one more routine. I hit one of the best routines of my life. And Sasha hit one of the best routines of his life. And they decided to pick Sasha to go in over me. And that was the night before opening ceremony. Oh, my gosh. And so this journey, this was this was over like a four week period that we had all of these selection procedures. And normally it's one competition. You do the competition, they select the team and you go. We had four selections before the Olympics. So the emotional roller coaster of thinking you're going to compete, not going to compete, thinking you're going to compete, not compete back and forth all the way up to opening ceremony was um, mentally and physically strenuous, to say the least. Abusive. (laughs) Almost. It was um, awful. Really, really challenging. Uh, But if anyone goes back and watches that competition, it's one of the most incredible performances by a Team USA that I think there has ever been. Team finals in 08 for what the men put on was absolutely mind-blowing um we were expected to not even make it to team finals most most you know journalists people for watching from the outside did not even think that we would finish uh, in the uh the finals qualified for finals and then uh they put on an extraordinary performance and won a bronze medal and uh sasha was the last 
routine up on pommel horse to secure the metal. And mm -hmm. I still have chills thinking about it. he did one of the most beautiful routines. Even if you just want to watch that routine, he did one of the most beautiful routines to secure the bronze medal for Team USA. And, um, and I think this little fun part of the story is that Sasha was a younger kid. He was in his early 20s at the time. Incredible gymnast, but not always present. Just a kid a lot of times. And uh, he forgot his uniform when we got to Beijing. And uh, I had to give him my uniform to go and compete in team finals. So the uniform that Sasha wore when he did that routine was mine. So when I got to go down on the floor with him afterwards and uh, celebrate the medal, it was very much a, a team win. And uh, I always feel very grateful that I was treated and continue to tr uh, be treated like I was out on the floor with them that day. But I was in stands and then on the floor afterwards getting a chance to celebrate. So what you said that that was mentally exhausting going through that process. You were later in your career. That was probably your last shot. Did, did it affect you mentally afterwards or were you able just to keep moving on? Because it didn't take you long before you found Power Monkey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I knew that was going to be my last competition. In fact, I had another blown out a ACL that no one knew about leading up to Beijing. I blown it out again in February of 08. I only told my coach. And so I had to have reconstructive surgery as soon as I got back from China. Um, and I've since gone out to blow another knee, which is another story. But my knees have always been weak. But yeah, so I knew that was going to be the end of my career. And did, did that mental stress kind of continue afterwards? What I'll say is that that Olympic journey turned me into who I am today. Um, you kind of have two paths when you get put in that situation and don't get put on the team. And I've seen how other people in the past have treated the alternate, the reserve position, and you can make a big deal out of it in terms of thinking it's about you and putting the team second. And I never wanted to do that. I, I grew up loving the team aspect of gymnastics for as much as gymnastics is an individual sport. I have always and continue to look at it as a team sport. And so I knew my role, no matter whether I whether or not I was, actively competing in one of the events on the floor was that I was still participating as part of the team. So carry your bags, bring your water, bring the uniform that you need to, to compete in. I wanted to do everything I could to make sure that the team succeeded. And I think I did that as well as any, anyone could. And I've, I've taken that mentality to every next phase of my life, whether that building a power monkey team and, and making everyone uh, who's a part of Power Monkey feel as important as the next person and making sure that collectively we win rather than individually we win. And so while the journey was mentally stressful, yes, in the moment, I became who I am today because of that challenge. And I've continued to dictate my life according to those challenges. So um, I don't look at it as a negative. I look at it as uh, it ended up being one of the biggest positives in my life. Well, and even the way you talk ending. about even the way you talk about the routine, the, the, you know, the fact that you went through all those sort of mental gymnastics just to just to be there and get there and then to not be able to compete with the way you talked about how the team got bronze. Like you can just tell that you're so proud and I, you're not I'm you're so not bitter about it. it at all. No, you know? no, I, it doesn't yeah. even in my vocabulary. I I love every one of those other guys. They're like brothers. Uh, we had a 10 year anniversary back in 2018 where we hadn't yes. all seen each other in a long time. The coaches, the staff, we all got together and um it was great to see everybody and we just fell right back into our rhythm again. It, it's a real brotherhood for sure. Very cool. I love that because it's a, it's one of those pivotal moments in life where you can choose to play the victim or not and be strong in the moment and be present and enjoy it. And it's cool that you took that moment and how it led to where you are today. Oh, thank you. I mean, life is tough. I mean, if you don't, if you have not, uh, observed or uh, felt challenges in your life, uh, you probably have been sheltered. <laughs> you probably haven't been outside very much. And the, how you deal with those challenges really, I think, is an important part of growth as a person. And um, that was one of the biggest obstacles in my life. And I'm really proud of the path that I decided to take in terms of being confronted with it. In my research, I found that you had an interesting job in high school back in New Jersey where you worked at a surf shop. Yeah. How'd you know that? Promoting oh, it, goodness. trying to get people to come in. And that yeah. was, you jumped on a trampoline yeah. all day. All day. <laughs> all day. 
Yeah, I have uh, I grew up in Jersey and uh, I grew up by the beach. We have a beach house in Belmar, New Jersey. So kind of like where Jersey Shore was shot, but down, down the shore. Yeah, down the shore. I like I love that place. Like New Jersey. I'm a huge Jersey guy. I miss the East Coast. I live in the West Coast now. But uh, yeah, I grew up right there and, you know, surfing the tiny waves of New Jersey. And um, it was a great surf shop down there. Eastern Lions is actually still there. And uh, they would promote, you know, people coming in. They put a trampoline outside one day. And I was like, what is this? So I just was like, you had to pay a couple bucks to, like, bounce on the trampoline. It was one of the most unsafe things. I would not recommend it at all. It was like <laughs> concrete everywhere, no mats, no nothing. But, you know, this was 30 years ago. So not too much consideration for that. And I started doing some flips and twists and all the stuff I learned in gymnastics. And they were like, whoa, this is awesome. And people started coming around watching. And they were like, do you want a job? Do you want to just do this? So I was like, yeah, absolutely. I get the bounce trampoline all day in front of the ocean and I uh, get paid for it. So I uh, that was one of the best summers of my life, just bouncing trampoline all day and uh, bringing some people into Eastern Lines. That's what I need to do to get people into the affiliate. I got to start putting it. I got to put a trampoline out in the parking lot. Good idea. It works. Hire, hire Eliana to just do like her fulls in the on the trampoline. <laughs> That'd be cool. She'd, she'd do that for sure. She needs a job. <laughs> Understandable. So how do you go from drum, jumping on a trampoline to being an acrobat for Victoria's Secret? Oh, my goodness. Yes. Another amazing. Is this where you story. met your wife? No. It was right okay. before I met my wife. Right before okay. I met my wife. But I was living in Italy, um, and I just moved back from living in Rome. I'm an Italian citizen, and after I coached Stanford, um, and then I moved to Italy, and then I moved back to the city. And uh, I met my partner. Uh, who's my, my co-owner with Power Monkey, Shane Garrity. He was a gymnast too, went to Syracuse and then became a stuntman and a performer. And uh, he hired me and a bunch of other national team members to be performers, gymnasts uh, at the 2010 Victoria's Secret Show. And it was uh, one of the- <laughs> Were you of dying? The cool, one of the coolest <laughs> experiences of my life. Like my wife hates how much I talk about it, but- <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's before I met you, before I met right. you. And, uh, this is, this is a funny story too. So I, you know, been doing CrossFit for a little while when I got asked to do it. And a few days before I did a hundred pull-ups for time and I got rhabdo mm -hmm. and, uh, it was pretty bad and I, I couldn't move my arms. So I, you know, I had to go to the emergency room and do all these tests and, you know, um, had this gig and I was like, I have to do this. Like, there's no way that I'm not going to do this thing. So we had rehearsals for a few days and the hospital was checking my blood work and they were going to let me know whether or not I needed to come in for more tests or whatever else. And they didn't contact me for days and they didn't contact me until I was about to go and perform. They're like, you have to come in. They finally called and were like, you have to come to the hospital right now. I was like, I can, I'm going to perform. Now. There's no way I'm leaving this thing. <laughs> uh, to come in the hospital. I was like, I'm don't call me. You should have called me days ago. And that's it. So I fortunately was able to get my arms enough to be able to like tumble down the stage and do all these other little stupid gymnastics party tricks out on the stage. But yeah, if anybody goes and watches uh, some of the highlights from the 2010 Victoria's Secret show, I'm front and center. I got a lot of airtime from that, that uh, CBS coverage. I'm right, right there in the middle, middle of the stage. And then I tumble down the stage with me and Morgan, Morgan Hom was the one I was telling you about from the OA team. He was on the other side with me. And one of the models was coming, walking down the runway with a fake barbell on her back. It was very CrossFit, barbell and gymnastics. Yeah. She was walking with this fake barbell down the stage. and um, <laughs> Fake because if she had put it, a real barbell on her back, yeah, she would have collapsed. She would have collapsed. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> 35 pounds is really heavy. Yeah. And uh, sh we did two shows. And... The first one kind of went on without a hitch. We, we all kind of hit our marks and did a good job. And then between the shows, the girls started drinking a lot. They started having a lot of champagne and they were like, okay, we're done. And I think they were a little tipsy <laughs> going into the second show. And this particular model, she messed up what she was supposed to do. She was supposed to stay at the end of the runway. runway. And she ended up, while we like tumbled down to her and then we were going to take the, the dumbbell off her back and then walk back. But she started walking back towards us as we were tumbling. And most of me and Morgan were like, I don't know what's going to happen. We <laughs> almost kicked her off the stage. Like we were so <laughs> close. There's a picture and Morgan actually brings his leg in 
You can see like his leg turning in. He actually moved so that he actually wouldn't kick her. To not hit her. Beautiful photo. But we were very close to kicking the model into like Vin Diesel's lap in the front row. Whoever was there, it was uh, <laughs> it was uh, one fantastic. of those close calls. <laughs> so but you yes, meet Shane very doing do, for sure. <laughs> Love it. You meet you meet Shane doing this, and how yeah. did you guys come up with the idea to start Power Monkey? It started with our ring thing. So our ring thing was our our ring training apparatus. Uh, it's a ring training tool. 50-50 device, you go to any gymnastics gym, most of the most boys' gymnastics programs will go to a hardware store and put a bunch of crap together and make one, and we wanted to make a really high-end one. And so we, we made one. We created a little promo video for it, and we started to shop it around to a bunch of different equipment manufacturers. And Power Monkey was an existing company, and they were a mom-and-pop equipment manufacturer down in Florida, St. Pete area. And... They started to make the ring things for us. I was a traveling salesman carrying, carrying these things on my back, going to gym, CrossFit gyms all around the country. The first ones I sold were to Julie Fouché out in Ann Arbor um, years and years ago. I used to help out Michigan's gymnastics team, and I brought a bunch, and they bought three. I was like, I can't believe they bought three. going to sell a million of these things, and it was just like the start. Realized that selling is a lot harder than you might think. Uh, <laughs> and then that grew into – creating some content and we ended up becoming partners with um, with the original owners. Then we bought them out and then uh, took power monkey on this path to more events and uh, digital education. So it started just as like a gymnastics training component after the, the ring thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we, we wanted to do gymnastics and weightlifting. It was kind of those two components because uh, early on I had uh, started doing some seminars with Chad Vaughn. Uh, Chad and I were both part of the 08 team. Chad, Chad was on 04 and 08 as an Olympian. And I lived at the Olympic Training Center and a lot of weightlifters used to live there too. And Chad didn't live there, but he would come in and out. And I remember seeing Chad over the years when we were both competing for Team USA. And then we ended up doing a seminar together at CrossFit Milford uh, in Connecticut where um, a close friend of the Power Monkey family, uh, Jason Lydon, uh, invited us out to teach a seminar. And we were like, hey, we should do gymnastics and weightlifting together. That's really not happening right now. There's very little education around gymnastics in general. Uh, there was more resources around weightlifting, but nobody was trying to pair them together to be able to kind of maybe see where the similarities were, how each of the sports could help each other. So we, we started doing gymnastics and weightlifting seminars together and then built the staff from that standpoint. We just thought that uh, these little niche sports needed a little bit more of uh, a space to be able to highlight our specialties. And so it grew from there. So the seminars come first. Did programming come next or the camp? Um, camp. Camp came okay. next. So yeah, camp came in 2013 so we're actually coming up on our 10th year anniversary of camp we were doing some programming for some individual athletes and things like that and co coaching classes so there was some like you know structure starting to be built around programs and, and structure around actually uh, teaching skill development but camp was something that i i really wanted to do from an early stage this facility that we use for camp out in the middle of nowhere tennessee is a kids gymnastics camp. Uh, it's called Flip Fest. It's owned by two Olympic gymnastics friends of mine, John Roethlisberger and John McCready. And I've been going there for years, teaching little kids gymnastics in the summers. And I just thought, you know, they use it for 10 weeks in the summer and then they don't really use it for the rest of the year. And they have some other events. I was like, this could be an incredible location for an adult fitness camp. So, um, you know, we tried our first one in the um, spring of 2013. And uh, we're like, you know, this could work. You know, we lost a lot of money. Not too many people showed up. But when people got on the bus home after that first week, they were crying. And they, after one week of hanging out with each other, these 30 participants from all over the world, we had campers from all over the world, that first one, they were crying. And I couldn't believe that people could build such long lasting relationships in such a short period of time. And I said that we have something special here. And I wanted to make sure that we continue to grow it. And uh, it's one, it's been one of the proudest things in my life, uh, power monkey camp, what it's turned into now. Um, the it's family reunion two times a year, not just for the coaches and the staff, but a lot of the campers that keep coming back. We have campers of every age, every background, 40 plus countries have come out to camp. 
Um, we have a camper that's come 12 times in a row. She's incredible. We have a little uh, wow. shout out to Karen Ward. who's an affiliate owner down in Atlanta. And she's come 12 times in a row because she just loves being with us. And we love having her. But it's a really, really special event. And uh, if there's anybody that's ever been interested in coming to camp and been on the border of deciding to sign up, do it. It's worth it. It'll be the best week of your year. Not just saying that as a salesman, but I genuinely believe that it would be something that would uh, would highlight your year if you can make it out. It's a really special event. It feel it feels to me like uh, like a fantasy camp. You know, if you're like a baseball fan and yeah. going to going to fantasy camp, I I it has been on my list since 2014, probably something that I've wanted to do. And we're starting to get it. serious about it now. Yeah, you got to do it. Next year's 10 year anniversary. You got some cool things planned for it. Uh, it really is a blast. Everything you see on social or on our videos and everything, it's even better in person. You have to experience it in person to really get a true sense of it. Yeah, I need to go. And um, do you guys offer CEUs for level three? We do. Yeah, um, we probably offer Great. one of the most out of anything that CrossFit offers. There's 32 U CEUs you can get yeah. in one week. So if it's you're in L3 chunk. or inspiring L3, it's 32 of the 50 you get in one week. So it's a big chunk. That's another reason wow. I want to go. Cool. Well, and it, the concept is brilliant because, you know, when you're a kid and you go to summer camp or church camp or whatever it is, you, some of those people you meet at that camp, you stay friends with forever. Uh, and it's amazing when you're that intimate with a group of people in a short amount of time, turn it into adult camp. And all of a yep. sudden you get the same thing on a macro level and, and it just keeps growing. So and kudos to you to for, for seeing that. <laughs> Say it again. What's that? He said, add a, kudos add a few to you for the equation. A few beers. Oh. <laughs> yeah. But yes, thank you. I appreciate that, Scott. And um, I, I grew up going to summer camp when I was a kid and I loved it. And it was something that I wanted to recreate now that I'm an adult and we get to do it. And um, the relationships that have been built, the job opportunities that have come out of it. Um, we, we had two coaches get married at camp. We, wow. we had... We had two other campers get married. Uh, we had some kids be born because of the relationships that people found at camp. We've had some incredible relation. We had two campers get engaged at camp. Uh, we had like the, the things that have come from camp are life changing more than what you're going to learn from an educational standpoint. And I'll put my staff against anyone in the world in terms of their expertise with our 30 plus staff members. Uh, the experience is going to be more impactful than the information that you're going to get out of it. And uh, yeah. I, I, I can't say enough about it. I just, and it's not anything that I've done or that our staff has done. It's more that it organically grew in this way because of just the quality of the people, the quality of the people that are there. We care about everybody. It's a very inclusive camp from teenagers all the way up to campers in their mid eighties. Everyone is treated the same. Everyone's put together with games athletes. You know, you have Fraser there, you have Catcher in there, whoever it might be. Everyone's the same. We're all hanging out. We're all training together. And uh, that's a place in the world that you can do that for a full week. So you seem to love the coaching aspect of this. What is it, what is it like to coach for that week? Because I know like I went to swim camp every summer when I was a, when I became an elite swimmer, right? I, and I would, it was a week of full focus on my craft. What is it like to have someone to be able to work with them for that week? So from my perspective, um, it's a very exhausting week. Like just to be honest from my, my role, because, you know, I'm overseeing the coaches, you know, we have a great staff who help in a lot of areas, but kind of have my hand in everything from, you know, what the kitchen staff is doing to what the, the, the store is doing in terms of selling apparel to, um, you know, the logistics of getting people back and forth in the airport and all those things. So we have staff, but, you know, managing all of these little components of 150 to 170 people is a lot add on top of that the um just the coaching i coach a station uh, i coach the handstand station uh it's tiring i end up sleeping for like a week afterwards just to kind of get my bearings again but i wouldn't change it for the world again like i said i that's where i want to be so i pour every part of my being into that week so that every camper feels like it's their first time so the 12-time camper still gets the same energy as the person that's tentatively coming for their first time. And so we, we really preach that to the staff. And 
I think it's something that we don't have to preach because they already do that on their own. But you come to camp for the first time, for the 12th time, and you're going to get the same energy from all of our coaching staff because we love what we do so much. When you were at Stanford, you studied human biology and psychology. Yeah. I'm not sure there's a better combination for a coach <laughs> than, those two, than those two areas of study. Did you have that plan back then? Not really. Uh, I never wanted to be a coach. In fact, I actively, mm. I talked about not wanting to be a coach. Um, I was considering medical school. I was considering PT school for a very long time. Uh, I did want to stay in sport. I love sports. I love, you know, all sports leagues I follow. I'm just a big sports fan in general. And um, so I wanted to be able to stay in the sports world, especially with the amount of injuries that I had had. I just saw the value of the PT world and I continue to see the value of the PT world. Um, but I had no desire to actually coach and it ended up being just fortuitous that my education ended up being helpful with coaching. Uh, and the reason why I didn't want to coach is because um, when you're an athlete, you're very, um, pri your, your priorities around you and you can't really see outside your individual bubble. You, your, your sleep schedules, your, your nutrition, your training is all about what do I need to do to maximize my, my ability to um, compete, perform well. And so I wasn't, I was never really looking at like, how can I help someone else? Like, I just, I need help for myself. It's a very selfish lifestyle being a, an athlete. Uh, and my coach at the Olympic Training Center, my last coach uh, was such a great coach that I never thought I would be able to do what he did. And I said, if I can't be on his level, it's not worth coaching. He, he could read minds. I could come into the gym. He didn't even need to tell me or I didn't even need to tell him what was going on. He just knew mentally whether or not I was going to be able to do something that day. And he would rearrange the schedule according to my mental state on the fly. And we had a whole team and he could do that for each individual person. He was so tuned in to the athlete's needs that I was like, I don't have this in me. This is something you either have or you don't. It's not something you learn. And um, he actually instilled in me what it meant to be a good coach and how, how you really need to care about the, the athletes that you work with. And he had that in spades. And when I turned the switch to actually understand that I actually do love coaching, that's what I try to bring to my coaching style is this, this real care and love for the individual beyond just what they're trying to learn. And um, yeah, it turned into a real passion of mine that I didn't think I had in me. So when is your, when is your next camp? Next camp is April 30th to May 6th. So uh, we're gearing up for 2023. And the following one after that will be September 24th to September 30th. Camp 19 and 20, like I said, it's our 10-year anniversary. So we're pretty excited about this year coming up. Do you have anything new in the works coming up? Actually, we do. Uh, one thing we didn't mention, uh, our Power Monkey training app. Uh, you know, we, we talked about the Ooh. event, our digital, our digital side. It was just unveiled yesterday, actually. So um, we, we've had an app for a while, uh, but it's been the, the programs are fantastic. Um, uh, I think it's done very well. Myself and another one of our coaches and a few of our weightlifting coaches have put programs in there. There's a lot of gymnastics, heavy stuff. Um, there's really four categories to the plans that are in the app. We have skill based plans. So get your first pull up, get a handstand, get a handstand, push up all those things that we do really well teaching skills. But we've also added some new other uh, categories of plans. We have one that's about volume building. So for those athletes that might have a muscle up, how do I go from one to five to 10 to 20 to 30 unbroken? That kind of thing. So we have some volume plans for the competitive ath athletes out there now that we're com continuing to build upon. We also have what we call 365, which are five to 10 minute workouts around right now, just your core. Uh, we have core 365, which will expand into other areas soon. But core is an area that we think people should be training on a daily basis. Getting a strong core will lead to strong movement. We call this kind of phase within the gymnastics development creation of good shapes. And core and mobility are the two components that go into creating good shapes. We're going to be coming out with Mobility 365 too. Bite-sized daily workouts around something you can use an accessory and add into any of your daily training. And the last one we call Monkey Method. Monkey Method is a GPP for gymnastics. Three to six day a week training around gymnastics, ring work, handstand work, mobility, core. All of these things that encompasses a well-rounded understanding around gymnastics work and it's something you can incorporate in either beginner, intermediate, and advanced levels. And like I said, three to six day a week there. So we're tackling it from a Love very well-rounded approach on um, gymnastics right now. And we're going to be building in 
a lot more of the specialties that we see at Power Monkey Camp into the future. Right now, check out Power Monkey Training and you'll get a pretty in-depth understanding of how we attack gymnastics training. So quick question about that. I'm assuming the skill-based and the volume-based um, are you need equipment to be able to do that type of programming. Some but of the program, the yes. Some of the program, no. But Okay. Yeah. And the core and the mobility, are they, are they, do they require any equipment? No. Um, some That's... of the core workouts might need like a bar to hang from. But for the most part, um, all of the core and all the mobility will be something you can just do in front of your TV, in front of your phone. Very, very easy. And these are all sort of That's a la carte. Awesome. Uh, it's one subscription. You get everything. You get everything oh, in the cool. app. You get everything for uh, twenty four ninety nine a month. Um, and there all is of those free, things. Yeah, you get everything for. Oh wow, That's bucks great. a month. Yeah, and there That's is you get a free core workout every day. So if you just download the app, you get a free core workout every day. Part of that core three sixty five, and you also get access to our video library. Our video library has like thousands of videos and movement breakdowns on everything that is sorted according to what movement you're trying to learn. And that's free in there. So I would highly recommend just downloading it. So you have access to the videos and the core stuff, even if you don't buy one of the plan, uh, it's still worth it to have like a nice, you know, uh, something in your pocket with all of those training tools. It's a really helpful thing to have. For sure. So it. they can download, download that from any app store. Apple, iOS and Android, Google. Power Monkey Training. Awesome. Yes, let us know what you think. We want to get feedback on it. We want to make it the best tool out there, and hopefully you guys enjoy it. But uh, definitely send us some feedback. I'll just give my email too, just Dave at Power Monkey Fitness. If you guys use it, let us know what we can do to make it better. And also, if you have any information or you're curious about camp or our events, just message us. Like We want to make sure that people have all the information. People are sometimes intimidated by camp when they see high-level CrossFitters going. It's meant for beginner and intermediate level athletes. So if you're feeling unsure, but you're a CrossFitter, you're an athlete that kind of goes in the gym and works on some of these things, I guarantee you it's for you. So if you have more questions about it, uh, happy to answer. And, uh, Did I get that right? Yep, that's, that's it. Right. That's it. Cool. Yep, so that's it. Um, you are you, on... Do you do any, um, like, are you for hire? Do you come out and do things for gyms yeah. and yep. people? Yep. Um, our, How's that work? Coaches, Mike service uh, is one of our weightlifting coaches does all of the, uh, ins and outs around, um, getting our course signups. I was just in Albany this past weekend in New York teaching a course. We just got back from Europe. We were in four countries in two weeks teaching courses out there. Uh, we are on the road a lot teaching courses. So just, uh, email Mike or info at power monkey fitness or Mike at power monkey fitness. If you're interested in having us out to one of your locations and we'll see if we can set something up. Awesome. So my last question is the, all the, all the hosts on this show are masters athletes, uh, in our late forties, early fifties, how hard is it? Is it possible for people at that age to do gymnastics correctly and without injury to shoulders and joints? Um, cause that's something I'm concerned about. It's an understandable. As a Clydesdale. Concern. Absolutely. It's, it's an understandable concern. And the answer is absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, but it takes one commitment and consistency, good progressions, and you know, um, making sure that you're understanding that this is a long-term process. You know, you're if you're in your 40s, you have that number of years of doing things either incorrectly or not building correct mobility or not um, good movement patterns. So it's going to take some time to start getting some good habits in place. If the expectation is that these are going to happen in a couple of weeks or a couple of months, it's unrealistic. But can it happen if you're diligent about it and you have someone that's actually keeping an eye on you and making sure you're doing things technically sound? 100%. We've seen some pretty extraordinary, um, not just body changes uh, physically, but movement pattern changes and uh, stability changes and all of these things that allow for longevity. That's really our goal, not just acquisition of a particular skill, but longevity within movement. And um, I will say that if you let us help you, we'll definitely help you get there. Well, we're already gotten people in the chat or downloading it. So that's Good. awesome. Great. Your, your app. Keep us posted. Let us know what you think. Yeah, you well, I'm, def to I'm definitely going to be in touch. So I'm working with um, an athlete right now who, um, who needs some gymnastics, needs to be assessed for gymnastics to make okay. sure that sort of we're on the right path and that this is something that we think we could do. And um, I definitely want um, 
and we have a budget to work with. So we, we want to get somebody out here to, uh, to evaluate that athlete and, and give us sort of a path forward on how to, how to make those goals happen. So Sounds good. I will definitely, yeah, definitely, definitely be in touch. Really that up. And you know, Delaware is not too far away from Jersey and I come back that way quite often. So, well, uh, yeah, I figured maybe we could coordinate something to sure. save me a little money to get you here, but you maybe it. I can help you, you get home. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Awesome. Yeah. And I definitely, I definitely want to come to camp. Um, I yeah, love Ohio's those days going away, to camp. You know? We have so many people from Ohio. Yeah, I can drive. drive. No, it's not far. Scott, we have to put no. that in our travel budget. Like, let's just do that. Yeah. It'll be worth I it. I want to go guaranteed. so bad. Guaranteed it's worth it. Yeah, I think the fall is perfect for us because we're so busy during the the compete season mm-hmm. that uh, fall would be perfect. But yeah, we got to get that in our budget. As long as as long as Con Porter's going to be there for Amy, that's how the only reason we get oh, Amy okay. to go. Well, we we'll have to have Con yet. We haven't had Con, Con out go. yet, so maybe we can add him to our. Uh, game could you imagine, Scott? She would die. <laughs> <laughs> she would die. I I would skip that oh, one. Man, yeah, right. <laughs> She'd pay for all of us to go. She is not with could... us. <laughs> She'd pay I'll put for you guys in separate groups. I'll put her yeah. in a group with Khan, and then you guys can be in a separate group. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. That would be great. Oh, I love it. Awesome. Oh, well, it's Dave, been this so was... good to meet you. You too. This I appreciate so the time today, guys. And I love your stories. We need to have you back sometime to hear sure, more I got a lot stories. More of them. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, we do, know, we do a lot of breaking down of workouts too, and things like that, where yeah. we talk about, um, you know, um, events that we attend or that we watch and sort of some opinions. And it sounds like you've got some really great insights that maybe not everyone hears about. So we'd love yeah. to have you on for that as well. Anything you need, I'm happy to help with, uh, trying to do a little commentary myself these days when it comes to these competitions, I'm pretty awesome. involved, you know, we'll be at Wadapalooza, we'll be at the games, we'll be at a bunch of other events. So, uh, happy to help in any way I can. Cool. And one last question from one question. of our listeners. Do you do Zoom yeah. consults? Sure. Uh, happy to. Um, you know, most of my programming is done with an in-person assessment and then doing some, you know, online programming from there, some remote stuff. But uh, happy to do a Zoom cons- consultation. Bruce, if you want to reach out, just email me and we'll try to set something up. Awesome. awesome. Well, thanks so much, Dave. You uh, got this it. has been a treat. Thanks, and I can't wait to uh, talk to you again. Absolutely. Have a great day, guys. Appreciate the time. <laughs>